I was born in Fairfield, Alabama, and Fairfield is a suburb of Birmingham, Alabama. It's the, also the location of Miles College, and it was uh, the, that particular part of Alabama was when I was growing up, was the center of sort of um, coal, iron. So there was coal mining throughout the area. There were the blast furnace, blast furnaces throughout. Bessemer is one of the suburbs and there are the Bessemer furnaces. So I grew up thinking that the sky at night was red because of all of the flames and everything from the furnaces that were nearby. But it was that kind of alabaster was also a, a, a product that was could be mined there. So it was a mining industry town at that point. It called itself the Pittsburgh of the South. <laughs> and it had the pollution of a Pittsburgh as well. My father had come from central Alabama. He came from a family, a farm family in central Alabama. Interestingly, he was born in 1899. He was the 15th of his, in his family. He was the last of 15 children. And so most of my aunts and uncles I never knew because they were really quite elderly by the time I was old enough to even think of, you know, who the people in my family were. My mother uh, had grown up in both Birmingham and also in Marion, Alabama, and her family had been connected to educators who had helped to establish the uh, school that later became Alabama State University. So she had more of an education. She had a master's degree and later taught school in Marion. And, and uh, my father was a self-taught person. He had a third grade education and he taught himself to repair things. He worked in the coal mines and in the steel mills, but he left that to start his own business. And he made enough money through his own business for us to live a, a comfortable life, even though we were by any standards be poor. Uh, we traveled widely. We were encouraged to read. We traveled anywhere you could go by car. So by the time I was, you know, 12 years old, I had been to Canada several times, had been through Mexico. Uh, we would go out to Los Angeles, to Pasadena. So I had traveled and understood the sort of geography of the United States by our car trips. Uh, these were usually my parents and my two brothers. My, I had two older sisters, but they had uh, uh, already gone away to college. So that's the, the circumstance that I grew up in. Fairfield was an incredibly segregated place, of course, as a part of being a suburb of Birmingham, all of Alabama was. And it was, uh, there was a laundromat that sort of, you know, many of the businesses there said whites only. No colors allowed, whites only, no Negroes allowed. There were restaurants that, where they would take your money if you wanted to go and get food there, but you'd have to go around to the back to a window near where they took out the garbage. And so, of course, those were places that we didn't care to go to. We had our own little community in Fairfield, and we had small restaurants, uh, that were black owned. We had a black owned pharmacy, uh, gas station, those places, because even the gas stations in Fairfield, there was a gas station that said whites only. They didn't even want you to drive in there to get gas. So it was that kind of place. And it was, uh, the community was very protective in one sense though. The principal of our school, the segregated school, even though we were given the hand-me-down books and uniforms and um, band instruments, we, our teachers and principals really tried to instill in us pride. We studied, I was surprised later to learn that I knew so much more about African American history than many of my colleagues and friends who had grown, who had gone to much, much better schools. But we then really adhered to Carter G. Woodson's notions of what should be told about African-American history, and so we learned both the history of the country, but we also learned African-American history and also had information about Native American history as well and would take trips to the mound, uh, the mounds that are nearby uh, Birmingham to understand more about the 
much greater heritage that Native Americans had had before the country, you know, before whites came to the, this country. So it was a fascinating place to grow up in in that way. And it was, uh, we, we had, I, my family was affected by the educators as well as many of the other kids that I grew up with, so much so that for many years we had alumni associations for our non-existent high school all over the country. So I used to belong to the Washington chapter of the Fairfield Industrial High School Alumni Association. And this was something where we raised money each year to send back to Fairfield as scholarships for kids there. And it was in honor of the principal who then had really uh, tried to instill in us uh, that no matter what our circumstances were, we should really strive to do our very best. I credit my parents um, foremost because they then, uh, my father especially encouraged curiosity. My mother encouraged me to read and to read as widely as possible. So from the youngest age, I just would read as much as I could and that they would supply me with books and magazines and, and try to uh, nurture my interest in that way. And my father just encouraged this kind of curiosity about the world at large. So he bought a cheap encyclopedia and would say that uh, if you don't have anything else to do, you should be reading that. And he, he said, read what? And he'd say, just any page, just turn to any page and I'll bet you'll find something interesting. And so, and that became something that we would do. We would just randomly, you know, turn to a page and sort of say, oh, this is interesting. Never heard of this before. <laughs> And it was, uh, we'd do science experiments. We'd go out in the countryside. This was a time when you had uh, Werner von Braun and the whole space age uh, taking place in Huntsville, Alabama. And so we then became, uh, learned about rocketry. We'd go out on the weekends and we'd make rockets and fire off our rockets. I knew how to make rocket, uh, the rocket fuel, which was essentially gunpowder. <laughs> And, but those were the kinds of things that we were just encouraged to just be curious to learn. Uh, I went to the, as a child, went to the Museum of Natural History in New York so many times that I thought, never again in my life do I want to go into that place. <laughs> because if I saw those mummies and those, those dioramas one more time, <laughs> and it was interesting to go there as an adult and see that it, unfortunately, a few years ago, it hadn't changed a lot. But it was that kind of curiosity and encouragement to just see and be interested in the world that started with my family. The, I applauded the courage of some of the other adults in my community. There was an attorney, Arthur Shores, <clears throat> and his house, was bombed several times. Uh, he, they lived in an area, we used to jokingly call it Bombing Hill, because it was the heart of the black community and that these were the people where you had upper middle class blacks who had very nice homes, and that they, their, those homes would often be the targets of whites who would then, uh, you know, set off explosives and Shores and some of the others worked with Shuttlesworth and the other people in the community trying to get voting rights and other rights for black people. So I admired their courage and their willingness to continue to work in civil rights even though it was obviously a very, very dangerous thing for them and their families. I started thinking about wanting to be involved in changing it even before I knew that it was something that I could do. I didn't know how I would be able to be involved, but that I am one of the people who thought that, um, that what a world, what an awful world we lived in when uh, Emmett Till was murdered. and. I'm 
see, that was, I think, what, 1955? And so I would have been uh, nine years old. So that was something that was, so even then, and to hear the adults in my world talking about that. And probably a couple of years later, there was a man in Birmingham. Uh, I later found out that I think his name was Aaron uh, Judge, uh, or Judge Aaron. Judge Aaron, I believe, because uh, it's an unusual name. But he was uh, just a, a, a worker on his way home there in Birmingham one evening, and he was kidnapped by a group of white men who tortured and castrated him. Um, they carved KKK on his chest. They castrated the man, and then to try to torture him further, they poured turpentine on his open wound. And that that act of putting the turpentine on ironically kept him from bleeding completely to death. And so he survived. But that was just, as you can imagine, everybody in the black community was talking about first the Till murder, then this, you know, brutal torturing of this man. And so that was in the air of, you know, the world that I was growing in, growing up in, even before I knew that I could somehow do anything. And it was only when, it was later when uh, Martin Luther King had come to town, there were the demonstrations. And that was the time that I felt now we can do something. They are asking for young people. We're young people. We can do something. I first became active in the movement as a high school student. I was in my hometown of Fairfield, Alabama, and which is a suburb of Birmingham when Martin Luther King was there in Birmingham jail. And that the disc jockeys and others in the started announcing that they really needed people to come out in support of Dr. King. And I then, along with some of my uh, fellow students from high school, there were probably about eight of us, I think, who then decided that we were going to participate in the march. Our principal, the principal of the school, was so determined that we would not, he did not want anybody from our school uh, participating in the civil rights activities, and he locked the school. He locked the school building. And we decided that we will go in defiance of this, and that we then definitely decided we would go and march downtown and, and go to downtown Birmingham and participate in the demonstrations, and we did. And so we were expelled from school for doing so. We were later reinstated, uh, but that we were expelled from school, we were arrested, and there were so many people who were arrested that we weren't put in jail, but we were uh, held at the fairgrounds in Alabama. And one of my best friends, her father was a minister there who then negotiated sort of our uh, release from the fairgrounds and also worked to have us reinstated in uh, our in our high school. But that was my first uh, time really becoming an activist in the movement. And <clears throat> how exactly did the Children's Crusade come about? It was very controversial when it was proposed. Was it as controversial to young people as it was for some of the older people who felt that you were being put in harm's way? Did you have any concern or fear about taking part of this? Or did you simply want to do this because it was something you felt that you needed to do? We were, uh, of course, I was going, later I learned of the the dangers in one sense. I mean, because we, but as young people, we then were somewhat naive, but also somewhat uncaring about that as much as we just wanted change. We did not want to live under the circumstances that we were living. And we wanted change. We wanted to see that change happen. We wanted to help make it happen. And so it was, 
just sort of infectious that we would say, yes, let's do it. And we left school, and we went down, and we found ourselves in a real mixture of people who, uh, and that was something where you, it was surprising just how many people were there and how many people were participating, and mostly young people. This was the march that became quite infamous because it was the time that uh, they used the uh, dogs and the police dogs, and also they used the fire hoses. And that was something that we were, we had come a much a, a longer distance coming from Fairfield from our neighborhood. And so we were not, none of us, none of my classmates were hit with fire hoses or were bitten by dogs. Uh, we were simply arrested, but it was something, it was still a kind of unnerving experience. And when we heard what had happened sort of up at the front of the demonstrations in a sense that it was alarming, but that didn't deter us. I mean, I think that if you would ask us, I'm sure that my classmates along with me would have said, yes, we would, would have gone back, you know, next day after day after day if we had to. Well, I think that we were a little too naive to be scared, unfortunately. <laughs> But I think, yes, they, they did. We've, we've had, since at our uh, reunions, we've talked about it. And, you know, and the other students have applauded us as heroes uh, because we were, uh, there were maybe a hundred of us in our graduating class. And that I think that there were probably only about eight of us who then left and participated in this. And so, we were a minority of students who then, you know, felt this way. But I do believe that uh, they felt the exact same way and would definitely have done it again. Were there any administrators or teachers who supported you? No, not to my knowledge. Uh, the, the, the one person who said absolutely no was the principal of our school and that he ran this school much in the way that a headmaster at a you know private school would and so it was the teachers sort of deferred to him and that so he was the final word and that we saw him as sort of being afraid of the white superintendent of schools and kowtowing to the county government uh, but Again, it was something where we didn't care. We, you know, we knew that he was probably feeling that we were putting him in an awful position and compromising him. But for us, the larger goal of combating segregation, of supporting Martin Luther King was much more important. As there were people that I looked up to, I mean, there was, uh, we had our black millionaire, A.G. Gaston, who uh, had he, he had made his money through the insurance business and funeral home. He had funeral home insurance and later had a hotel and some other things, uh, a bottling company. But he was uh, someone, he and my father were friends. And that even though he had made this, that he was quite wealthy, that he was very, uh, very accessible. And so they would then sort of invite us to come over to their their mansion to go swimming, you know. And his wife would then come and show us her latest fashions that she'd just gotten from Paris and things. But so they were our millionaires, but they were very, very, you know, sort of friendly, down home folks in many ways. And so I, uh, I, they were not a part for me of the movement, but they were also a, people who I felt that they were good role models in the sense that it wasn't about money that separated them from people, but it was money that allowed them to be a part of a community in a different way. I felt strengthened and emboldened from my experience. Um, in high school, and I felt that we had taken a stand. We had done something that the adults at that point had said, no, no, you can't, you shouldn't, 
don't do this, that we had marched, that we had participated in the movement in that small way, and that we had made a contribution. And I just felt that that, it felt good. It felt like it was the right thing to do. And it felt as though we were then finally beginning to sort of hammer away at this awful you know, circumstance that uh, defined how we all lived in the United States. And it was uh, something that I felt I want to see if there are other places, other ways in which I can do more. I even thought about my, my choice of career and everything at that point as a, something that would be my way of making a contribution. I was very, very focused at that point in my life on feeling that I wanted, I wanted to contribute. I wanted to make a change. I wanted to be part of the transformation in a positive way. Um, and I kept thinking that for my people, that medicine would be an important uh, part of that because medical care was something that was also ev uh, discriminatory. Every facet of our lives was affected by racism and segregation. And I felt that if I could then become a doctor, that that would be one way in which I could make a contribution. And so even though I was planning to go to college and really wanted to go to college, I was thinking of that too as a way of making a contribution. I graduated in the spring of 1963 from high school. And then I went to uh, New York during that summer because I had been, uh, my sisters were working in New York City and one of them worked at Sloan Kettering and had learned of an internship program for young people and encouraged me to apply and I was accepted and so I went to New York and worked there. And it was, uh, a, they were doing cancer research and it was both uh, a wonderful experience and also somewhat a discouraging experience too. Discouraging only in the sense that I would, I had these fantasies that, oh, wouldn't it be great? I will go to school and I will learn to cure cancer. And then working with these real scientists who were actually learning and working on cures, they would then describe their work and they'd worked for 20 years in some cases on some very small aspect of uh, cell behavior, yeah. And I would think, my goodness, I mean, it just gave me a sense of how hopeless and how, you know, massive some problems and how thorny some problems are. I returned to Alabama and I started uh, my studies at Tuskegee. And I uh, was able to go to Tuskegee because I had uh, I had won a scholarship, the Gorgas uh, Fund had given me a scholarship and it was a four year uh, tuition and room and board uh, grant to study. And so I then went to Tuskegee with that. And immediately after I got to Tuskegee, then I found that there were students who were demonstrating there against some of the awful conditions in Macon County, because Tuskegee was a bubble in much the way that many, any college campus can be. And if you were on the campus, then you could be immersed in this interesting world of Greek life and sororities and fraternities and kids from all over the country and football games and parades, homecoming parades and the like. But that if you stepped five feet off of that campus, then you could be called the N-word in a minute. Your life could be in danger. It was segregated. And even though Tuskegee itself was a very, had a large middle-class black community because it also was the site of a VA hospital and you had a community of prominent doctors and others who lived there full-time. You also, then it had the, uh, it had been the home for the Tuskegee Airmen. And so it had the legend of that as well. And there was a, a bridge out near the uh, school, the campus, where you know the legend was that it was 
where the airmen used to zip by. And so it was this place, Tuskegee, on one hand, could be this kind of <clears throat> haven and bubble of middle class life, but the rural area was, you were, you could have easily have thought you were going back into the times of enslavement because of the kind of rural grinding, rural poverty that was so visible there. Around that same time, I read uh, Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man, and I felt that it um, spoke so well of the reality of Tuskegee, including the statement uh, in Ellison's book about the statue of the founder. On Tuskegee's campus, there is a statue of Booker T. Washington and that he's supposed to be unlifting the veil of ignorance from this enslaved person. And I think Ellison says something to the effect that you can't really tell whether he's lifting the veil or pulling it back over. And that part of that, for me, the interpretation of that in part was the kind of controversy that was also about uh, uh, Booker T. Washington and the kind of education that he was advocating for uh, black people, the kind, his kind of leadership versus that of W.E.B. Du Bois. And Du Bois was much more of a person who was saying that we must educate ourselves to be leaders. We must educate ourselves to control our own destiny. And that Booker T. Washington was saying that it would be real practical if we learn how to do these things that could make us good service people for you know the for the white world, and that that we should be you know pleased and proud to do these things. And so that was the whole question of Tuskegee as this kind of agricultural and place, I mean, famous for George Washington Carver and you know, but of a place that was trying to have people fit into the world as it existed rather than to challenge that and to change it. I uh, went to, I didn't go in the summer. I went in the fall, actually, of 64. They'd, I In the summer, I went in the summer, that would now be the summer of 64, uh, when the students were actively participating in the, what was called Freedom Summer in Mississippi, I was in New York again, following it very closely uh, in the New York Times and other newspapers. And because I really, my heart was in Mississippi and I was so, now you had the whole mystery of the three missing civil rights workers as well. But I had chosen to, uh, I had, been offered that internship again. And so I had taken advantage of that and gone to New York City. And so I was of divided, you know, mixed minds in many ways, because on one hand, I felt here's a life, you know, once in a lifetime kind of opportunity to go here. And that had, they were encouraging me to think about going to Cornell Med School. And so I had this new world in New York City around Sloan Kettering that had a great appeal to me in many ways, but I also felt that I should be in Mississippi. I should be in Alabama or Mississippi, being a part of the change that's needed there. When I went back to school in the fall, the, uh, my first contact, I became active with the student uh, group at Tuskegee, and we had a student group, the Tuskegee Institute Advancement League, I think it was called, uh, T-I-A-L, uh, and that we then, it was our student group, uh, young woman Gwen Patton was one of these, another one of the student activists. Uh, sadly, most of my, most of the people who I, who were in the group are either they have died, some died during their uh, time in the movement or have passed away uh, from natural causes. But unfortunately, you know, most of the people have passed away. But Gwen Patton, Wendy Paris, uh, Samuel Schultz 
were some of the other students who were a part of this. Kathleen Cleaver was as well. And that we then, um, we were working there at Tuskegee on things that were happening in the county. Uh, Michael Lomax, who is now head of the United Negro College Fund, his mother ran a newspaper and uh, she published this newspaper from Los Angeles that was about then some of the events that were taking place in, the, in Tuskegee and the surrounding area. And through her work, I learned of this uh, professor there, Dr. Gomillion. And I met him and that he then, I went to meet with him because I wanted to understand what was happening around Tuskegee in that way. And he then explained to me gerrymandering, which I had until then never heard of, and about how the vote was being suppressed there. And so I started in my spare time going out into the rural areas around Tuskegee in Macon County and working on voter registration. And so it was a, a group of us, Samuel Young Jr., it was a small group of us who would then go out and we were trying to register as many people in the Macon County area to vote as possible. So that was what I started the school year doing in 64. Some people from SNCC, and I don't recall precisely who, I want to think that uh, William Winky Hall was one of the people, but, and Jim Foreman at some point, but they came through and were asking for student volunteers to go to Mississippi to help then with the registering people to vote and getting out the vote in Mississippi. And they now were getting ready to go through this challenge of the Democratic Party, the 1964 challenge with the Democratic Party. And so I then volunteered to do that. And that was another one of those moments where, you know, I found myself, I don't think, I didn't think of myself as, oh, as a woman, what will I do? Um, it was, they need people, I'll go. And I didn't think of myself in that kind of gendered way or anything, but I volunteered and volunteered not knowing where I was to go and stay for like a couple of weeks. And I didn't know where I'd be staying or what, but I was more than willing to, to go and do that. And so I went to and worked in Jackson in Hines County, Mississippi for those couple of weeks to do that. I was, uh, I was mostly in Jackson and I was incredibly, that's when I became so impressed with SNCC. That was my first time sort of seeing SNCC in action. It was really SNCC and COFO, some of CORE. There were some of the other groups still, remnants of them still there. But the people that I remembered most were SNCC people and that I was just in awe. I mean, I was like a groupie at a rock concert would be now, uh, just sitting there hearing these incredibly intelligent young men and women who were like, my age are a couple of years older, you know, but they were like maybe 18, 19, 20 years old. And they were talking about politics in a way that was just astonishing to me. They were so, there was so much clarity and they were, had so much awareness of the world. And it was, you know, quite impressive to me. These women, uh, Annie Pearl Avery, and uh, Cynthia Washington. And at that time, all of the, the women usually wore, you know, Judy, all of them, they wore blue jeans. And I mean, there, I don't think there was a dress, you know, anywhere near <laughs> the area, but they were all, uh, they were all, there was a self-confidence that they exuded that I thought was just incredible. And that they were, you know, they could talk about what needed to be done and, and organize themselves to do it. It wasn't as though they needed an older adult to do anything. So I found that quite impressive. Let's talk about some of your work in Lowndes County, and in particular, some of the voter education tools that you came up with along with your colleagues 
promote the voter registration project there? Sure. In 1965, Lowndes County became an important project for SNCC. And it was, uh, Lowndes County is right between Selma and Montgomery. And it's the county in between, and it's a county that has had a horrific history of lynchings and violence against black people. Um, so it was often called Lowndes Bloody Lowndes, Bloody Lowndes County. And we then, a, a group of people there, even though the county was majority black, there were only four registered voters. And there were people who were interested, particularly John Hewlett, who had uh, registered to vote in Birmingham, Alabama, and had moved back home to Lowndes County, and was interested in getting people registered, so had invited SNCC to work in the county. And I then came along with the others in SNCC to work there. And our first work was really getting people registered to vote. As a part of that, then we would we needed to create materials and that the in addition to the lack of opportunity for voting, the education was hor you know just horrible. I mean, people had very little access to education in general. So you had a high illiteracy rate among adults there. And of course, the polls, uh, they would use these poll tests to keep people from voting by asking them to recite information or to give information. And people, a lot of, you had a lot of people who just had never had the opportunity to become educated and so couldn't read or write. Symbols then, and this was whites as well as blacks, in that context, symbols for political parties become quite important. And the symbol for the uh, Democratic Party in Lowndes County was a white rooster. And it's the logo over it says white supremacy for the right. And the so it was this white chicken. And that when John Hewlett and the other people, when they were talking about creating the Lowndes County Freedom Organization, and we asked them, what do you want as your symbol? Then they said, what we need is a mean old black cat to run that white chicken out of this county. And so that's where they said, you know, in this part of Alabama, it used to have panthers in it and everything. And so a black panther would be just perfect as the symbol. And that we had uh, Stokely then asked the people at the Atlanta office if they could send something we needed an image to use. And they sent this little panther that was sort of like on the prowl and getting ready to leap. And so we thought, yeah, we can, okay, we'll use that. It turns out that that was the Clark College football mascot. <laughs> That was their symbol. That was the logo from Clark College. So we adapted that to use as then the Lowndes County Freedom Organization's symbol, which then some people would refer to it, oh, as the, the Black Panther. And that we then said, because we really wanted people who couldn't read and write to know then how to vote for their party, we then started seeing on the posters, vote pull the lever for the Black Panther. And then we started also, because we were concerned about violence at the polling place, we wanted to get across the message, pull the lever for the Panther and then go home. Pull the lever for the Black Panther and then go home. And somebody said, well, it would be great if we could, you know, get this out rather than we are handing out flyers, if we could get that message out in a bigger way. And I said, well, if you can get me to lumber, I could make billboards. I could draw it. I can I can draw something small. I can draw something big. We could make billboards and post them. So I made about three billboards that were posted across the around the county. And there's a photo of one of them where there's a they they were immediately shot up, as you might well imagine. And so there's a young man from I think Philadelphia who had come down and that he's standing there with a rifle, a young black man, to protect the billboard. Yeah. But we then also, Cortland Cox and I, would talk about 
how could we help the candidates? There were people who were sort of saying, well, you know, I don't think I would could run for sheriff because I, I don't know what a sheriff does. Or, you know, to be the tax assessor, what does a tax assessor do? And then they say, how can we decide whether Ms. Devine could be a good tax assessor or not if she wanted to run? What's the job? So we got the information about the jobs from the courthouse, and we then converted that into comic books because we thought the images could help tell the story and it would force us to keep the text really small. So and I drew these comic books uh, that would then tell the story of what the sheriff did, what the tax assessor, what the coroner uh, did. And I would just draw those. And that I did the same, Cortland had this essay that he had written called Mr. Black Man uh, about, you know, what good does it do you to have the vote? And it was about why vote? I mean, that was the, the real theme of it. And so I illustrated that as well and did that as a comic book about why it's important to vote and about how voting can give you in power and that you then can be the people who control the county government, the county budgets and things. And so it was a fun thing to do and that I never had any formal training in art. This was, again, just that kind of can-do attitude that had come from childhood, uh, where my father would, you know, I remember once a friend had a Monopoly set, and I thought, what a fun game, I want one. And my father said, no way that he would ever spend money for something like that. So I borrowed her game and made myself one. I just took the time and painted all of it. It was, I wish I had it now because I could sell it as folk art, but, <laughs> But I made the money, I made all of the, so, but I just made and looked at the box and how that was made and constructed it so that it was actually a, a full box, a full set. So I didn't know how to draw really, but those were things that I would just do. And that I could, if we needed a drawing, then I was willing to, and unless somebody else stepped forward, I was willing to do it. And so I made then the billboards, the comic books, and this material. It's nice to see it now. There's some of it in the Interpretive Center there. Yes, it was. I went back to Lowndes County about a year ago and interviewed some of the people there and was asking them what did it mean for them? Because to me, to define success, you have to have some way Success for whom? You know, who is this success for? And it was really wonderful to be so warmly received by the people in Lowndes County. I was surprised that they would even remember or know who I was, but to be so warmly received by them and for them to talk about what it meant for their own lives. And so it helped them to establish, uh, retain jobs and create jobs within the county to have those offices in city, in the county government. There were horror stories. I mean, I was sad to hear of ways in which some people allowed themselves to be manipulated in some cases so that they then, while they were holding an office, they may have had the power in one sense, but through economic means, then they didn't, uh, they were really still sort of uh, at the behest of others of the white minority in the county. So it was interesting to see what Lowndes County had become in many ways. Correct. I returned to Tuskegee and I attempted to keep a, do a balancing act of continuing my studies. And I was studying chemistry, biology. I took courses at the School of Veterinary Medicine there. I remember taking a parasitology course there that 
I'll take your word for it, because I have no idea what that is. <laughs> oh, it's the parasites that you find in cows and other large mammals and things. And <laughs> but and also a, a botany, you know, botany courses. And, and I enjoyed my studies. I liked learning, and so I enjoyed my studies very much. But I was also doing the balancing act of trying to uh, continue to be a real part of the student uh, group there too, with Gwen Patton and George Ware and the other students. Um, and so we would then meet. We George Ware was a student in the school of, George was a chemistry, I think he was a graduate chemistry student there, but he was older, a little older, and, and he had an apartment off campus. So we would often use his apartment as a place to have our meetings then, and we'd go and meet there and talk about what we were going to do in terms of our civil rights work in the county. Most of that was focused on the county and less we weren't really trying to change the school there. Some places where students really wanted to change their universities and change the curriculum and things, we were much more focused on trying to eradicate ra racism there in Tuskegee, in the uh, beyond the campus, and in Macon County. So we were would have those meetings, and gradually more and more SNCC people were beginning to come to the county and to meet with us. And so we would have these these meetings there. I'm not quite sure of the chronology. I have to, I would have to look to do some research to find out. But at one point, there were people like Martin Luther King came through, Malcolm X came through. So I did, I had the opportunity to meet both of them. Malcolm X spoke there. Um, but I'm not quite sure what year that was, but I know it was, I want to think it was during the time when I was still an actual student there. But we then, I was doing this balancing act, which I continued all the way up to early, um, I think it was really, I'd have to look up the year again. I'm terrible with years now. But one of my classmates was killed, and this was Samuel, Samuel Young, Jr., and that was a um, that was rather a defining point for me, um, and it was one of those times when I decided that okay, you can't let this you know you have to make a decision. You can't be half in or not. And I decided that I would leave school and work full time with SNCC, and that was uh, after. Sammy was killed. He was a college student who was then working, like the rest of us were, on the voting rights and going out canvassing in the county and all, and that so to have him be murdered was to again reinforce our collective vulnerability, in my view. And it was that if this could happen to Sammy, it can happen to any one of us. Male, female, doesn't matter. It could happen to you. And that uh, led you to go to work full time. That's correct. And what exactly did that mean? You just when you say I went to work full time for SNCC, what's the transition from being a student activist, part timer, volunteer, to taking that big plunge? What's that? What's the big difference there? It's the the big difference is that I now. Um, Rather than when I was a student at Tuskegee, I had a tiny, I had a little studio apartment uh, off campus, and that my day was going to classes and then doing my student act, you know, my student activism. Uh, once I said, "This is what I'm going to do," suddenly I had a sleeping bag. I had a duffel bag with a small amount of clothing in it, and now I was going to live with a group of people, many of whom I did not know, in a freedom house. And I was going to get up in the mornings and go out into a field, possibly, a rural area, and knock on shacks and do this sometimes surreptitiously because 
we didn't want the people to be evicted from the places where they were sharecroppers. And I was going to try to meet as many people as possible to encourage them to come to a mass meeting where we would then try to encourage them to register to vote. But so that's now how my world was shifting and was shaped towards that. And I worked in first in Wilcox County and lived in the Freedom House there with a group of people. Um, and then, and, and I was very fortunate because uh, shortly thereafter, um, let's see, I had, I had a car because my father, remember with the, uh, if I can fix it, I can have it. Uh, I had a car and that shortly thereafter though, um, I, after I went into the movement, then SNCC assigned me a car. And so I then could, uh, would go with driving my group from Wilcox County to meetings in Lowndes County. And we would be meeting with people from the other different counties. And it was through that that I got those meetings that I got to know Stokely and Cortland Cox and Ralph Featherstone, and Bob Mance and some of the other people more. And they then asked if I would leave Wilcox County and come to work with them in, uh, over in Lowndes County. Well, and I'll use Lowndes County as an example, but this Wilcox County could, could easily have been the, the place as well. But you would, uh, you get up in the morning and that you would go out, you'd meet, you'd have a, a small meeting, but a small meeting would be sort, sort of everybody who's living there, working there, gathering and sort of saying, okay, let's look at the map. Where are you going today? And what part are you going to cover? And where will you go? Why don't you take the car, drop me here, drop this person here, and then we'll all come back at this point. I think I can get a ride with this person I'll need you to pick me up or, so we were coordinating, and this is no cell phones, remember. <laughs> this is no landlines even practically in these areas, in these circumstances. So you, you can't call somebody on the phone or anything. So you had to work out where are you going to, where are you and how will you move from one place to the other? Because you're talking about counties, rural areas that are spread out and that uh, there are hostile whites driving around in pickup trucks with gun racks. And so you want to be well aware of where you are and your surroundings and everything. We usually would have met on Sunday at the church, some people who then would say, oh yes, well you should come and talk to me and I'll introduce you to my cousin who lives down, you know, in this place or something. So that's how you were making, you were mapping out these contacts and making contacts with people. And you could end up going, I remember once going and spending the night with a family because that, the only time that I would be able to really talk with them was at night. They worked the fields. They were cotton, doing picking cotton and they worked the fields during the day. And so the only time that we could talk was at night. And so, and they brought some other people over and then we talked about why it would be important to go and register to vote and what we could gain from voting. And so you, that was how you spend your day. You'd come back in the evening to the Freedom House where we stayed. And those would be your moments of entertainment and levity where uh, you, somebody would sometimes have a record player and you could put on a 45 or a stack of 45s, and you'd have music and you'd dance and joke around and flirt. And so that was the, the fun of it all. And that, uh, that I remember once for as, as a fun moment, a group of us, uh, there was a creek nearby and a, gr a group of us then on a, like it was a, a Saturday or something, we went swimming in the creek. So those were, that was your leisure. 
but then you you had very little leisure because you were usually really busy with these meetings, and you were uh, spent a lot of time with the local people. These were the uh, adults, the families that had invited you to come into the county, and they would then usually tell you about meetings or about developments within the county. And so you would then, sometimes you'd feel that, oh, that merits a mass meeting. We should get everybody together for a mass meeting to talk about this, or that here's an opportunity for someone to run for an office or something. And so that could be the occasion for getting together. But I should go back. At, during the time before I left uh, Tuskegee, one of the activities that we as Tuskegee students became involved in was, uh, and this was very much with SNCC. I was not in SNCC at this time, but I was very much working with SNCC, but as a, I was working with SNCC as a Tuskegee student. And this was uh, during the time of the, the march between Montgomery and Selma. And that around this time, then, Martin Luther King had decided that they wouldn't march, but that we then would, uh, went from Tuskegee during the those days that they were trying to decide about whether they are going to march. This is the Pettus Bridge after John Lewis and others were injured there. Um, <clears throat> we uh, were marching in front of that we'd go down to the Alabama State Capitol in Montgomery, which is a relatively short distance from Tuskegee, and we would go down and protest there. And so we would, students, would march around with our picket sign. I don't even recall what our picket sign said now, but we were marching around there. And uh, there was one day when we were doing that, and the Klan decided to have a counter protest, and the Klan started coming up the hill towards the Capitol. And we're then marching in our loop right there. They're the state troopers who have their billy clubs, and they're like hitting their, smacking their billy clubs on their hands, like, can't wait to use this on you, you know, or something. And now, to add to things, here's the Klan coming up the hill. And so that was a rather frightening moment because we were then beginning to worry about us, this small group of Tuskegee students, the Klan, the state troopers with their billy clubs and everything, and that when before the Klan reaches where we are, one of the troopers said, arrest them all, and arrested us. And that we were, on one hand, horrified to be arrested, and we had gone through our training so that you knew that if they sort of said they were going to arrest you, that the safest thing to do was to go limp, which would be you just sort of, you know, fall down like a rag doll. And then they would carry you and toss you in to the police van. And that we did that, and that we were talking in the van about how it was, uh, on one hand, it was terrible to be arrested, but it was a relief not to be confronted directly by the Klan, because we were really afraid of what might happen if the Klan had, you know, actually reached us and whether the troopers would have, they, we certainly didn't think that they were going to defend us. Yeah, so that was one of those odd moments in life where, <laughs> where it's like, oh, good, we're in a police van, we're heading to jail and not at the mercy of that group out there. <laughs> So I spent uh, almost a week, I think it was, in jail. And so during the time of the actual Selma to Montgomery march, then uh, we were in jail. And I have in the Alabama archives, 
I have my mug shot is uh, there, and it's they they now have it. It's available as as a part of their archive. So I have my mug shot to thank for that, and as a reminder of when I was an inch taller and many pounds lighter. <laughs> I worked, uh, after Lowndes County, I moved to Atlanta and worked then in the Atlanta office, uh, in the Atlanta SNCC office. And I, obviously working in the Atlanta SNCC office meant that I met then Julian Bond. I, uh, Julian was there, as well as there were other, some other fabulous people, Karen Spellman, uh, who lives here in Washington now, uh, Ethel Miner, who had been Malcolm X's secretary and who was working there uh, at, in the SNCC office. And the SNCC office was just, a, it was a place where there was never a dull moment because there were people constantly coming through from New York or from the field in Mississippi, Alabama. So it was just always full of activity, full of energy. The printing press with Wilson Brown was always going full steam ahead. Julian was in the midst of all of this energy and activity. Julian was always Mr. Cool, Mr. Calm, and with an incredible sense of humor as well. So I treasured Julian so much throughout the years for his political savvy, his intellect. I mean, he could nail it just really quickly of what a problem was and be so incredibly articulate about it. And then later, he could be so funny, just so warm and funny. And so I really, really valued him as a person. I thought that he contributed. Um, so much to SNCC in even though he was such he was one of the young people that he uh, there was a maturity that he brought to it and he, there was an expectation of a kind of professionalism that he brought to his work that then meant that the standards that he was setting in, in many ways affected all of the people who worked, whether it was on the student voice, uh, the student, the SNCC newspaper, or whether it was in c setting up communications or press opportunities or managing the press. You know, Julian was always so masterful about all of this. I, it was uh, my pleasure that living here in Washington, in you know later years, then we were able to continue that friendship, uh, and I saw more of him when he was working with another friend of mine, Aviva Kempner, on her film about the Rosenwald schools, and that uh, Julian made himself so available to Aviva uh, for that film that that she and Pam became good friends as well, but that. It was to me just another example of how generous Julian was with himself to always be giving of that. And we, as we were setting up our SNCC legacy project here within the last few years, that then Julian was also very, very active in helping to contribute time and energy to that as well. I've, I've heard Julian described as the griot of SNCC. Is, is that a fair assessment? Uh, yes, I mean, Julian was, I would say he was more the poet in some ways too though. That, uh, but yes, it would be a fair assessment to say that uh, Julian definitely carried forth a lot of SNCC stories. I just regret that his life was cut short before he was able to, to really tell so many of them in forms that would just continue to live on and on. I think that he really cherished his uh, being in the classroom. I think he enjoyed that more than he enjoyed his role with the NAACP and other organizations because I think he really enjoyed translating what we call transferring the wealth, the intellectual wealth, you know, how in, in families, a family is 
incredibly wealthy, then they want to make sure that the wealth is handed down to the next generation. I think Julian felt that we as SNCC people had an intellectual wealth that we could give and that that was something that he saw the classroom as a very useful place for contributing that intellectual wealth to a new generation. I think that his, I think the primary legacy of Julian Bond to the movement was the, the, the clarity and the, the elegance with which he conveyed the lessons from the past through himself to students and young people of today. Would you consider yourself to be part of the Emmett Till generation? Uh, very definitely in the sense that uh, when Emmett Till was murdered, uh, my classmates, my family, all of us were so affected by that, by what had happened to him. And it was the horror of it. And it was, we knew that these, we knew of other lynchings and things, but there was something so horrific about this that it was something that my entire community was talking about and that we were all just appalled and, and very definitely focused on this. And it, it, it didn't matter to me that Emmett Till was a young man. That wasn't the point. I mean, it was, this was a black person. This was a person. It was, this could have happened to any African American. And that was something that was just, uh, it was alarming and frightening mm -hmm. because I was quite young. And to hear all of the people, my parents, my family talking about this was just quite alarming. And so I just felt, how, what a world, what kind of world do we live in? And the, it's interesting because we had relatives. We'd visit uh, relatives who lived in other states or other people would come to visit us. And there was this notion among some people that, oh my goodness, Mississippi is a scary place. And mm -hmm. that was so insane to me. I lived in Alabama. Alabama was a scary place. Yeah. Okay, so my first question to you um, stems from a chapter I read in a book about Fred Hampton's murder. And there's a quote from Fred Hampton that where he talks about being 20 and willing to die for the movement and to pretty much like put everything on the line um, for black freedom. And it's a concept that I think was very strong during the civil rights movement and something you definitely showed in your willingness to be expelled and like definitely put yourself in dangerous situations. But I think today, a lot of student activists, at least that I know, um, we don't really share that same level of, I guess, like willingness to like risk it all, especially when it comes to our education or even our lives. Um, and I've been kind of grappling with why that might be um, and I think a large a large part of it has to do with the fact that you know we always say like our ancestors fought for the right for us to go to school like we should never give that up regardless of what the situation may be but I'm also not sure if it's just a different time um, and the way racism looks today is obviously a lot different than it did back in the 60s and 50s I'm just not sure like what your take is on it and like maybe why student activists today or even activists in general, even if they aren't students, I think I think that willingness to even like risk our lives or education isn't necessarily as present. And and I'm not so sure that that's the case. I mean, I I meet um, student activists and I meet young people who are very active in Black Lives Matter or BYP 100 or other organizations who. Uh, I think are making enormous sacrifices mm -hmm. because just to be politically active these days usually means that you're working with a nonprofit organization mm -hmm. or you're living at a subsistence level. I mean, these are not people who are driving Teslas or, uh, <laughs> you know, jetting off to some exotic place for a vacation. So I think mm -hmm. that I do see students 
who are making uh, enormous, uh, and young people, not necessarily only students, making enormous sacrifices for their political beliefs or to further you know, what they feel is a necessary cause. Mm -hmm. I think it has, uh, I don't want to, uh, for anybody to over romanticize mm -hmm. what we did because mm -hmm. I don't think that it was, first of all, a lot of people will say, oh, when I see these, the films and things of the past, mm -hmm. I see all of these people. Mm -hmm. We were always a small group. Mm -hmm. students. It wasn't as though the entire campus mm -hmm. of Tuskegee or the entire campus of my high school were activists. You know, out of 100 students in that year's class, mm -hmm. there were probably only about eight of us who mm -hmm. were then willing to, you know, go and be expelled and to participate in a march. Mm -hmm. And I certainly don't think that it is necessary for people to put themselves in harm's way in order to mm -hmm. do political work and to be active. I don't think, I wouldn't encourage it. I wouldn't, you know, I, no, I wouldn't act, you know, I wouldn't advocate that for anyone. I think that there are certain circumstances that almost happen to us mm -hmm. where we have to protect ourselves mm -hmm. and we have to be alert mm -hmm. that we could be affected by. But I think that uh, we, that, First of all, what we did was only part of what needs to be done. Mm -hmm. And what the people of the other generations before us uh, did, that they did what they could, mm -hmm. and now we've done what we could, and we're handing it on to generations to come mm -hmm. to do more right. and to do other things. But I don't think those other things have to echo or be the same as what was done in the past. Mm -hmm. I would, I'm would. i glad nobody has to go and integrate a lunch counter. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. you know, so that's out of the way. Mm -hmm. But economic justice, equal pay for women, mm -hmm. people who are transgender feeling safe as they are, mm -hmm. you know, those there's so much that still needs to be done. Mm -hmm. And that I do believe, I'm optimistic, I believe that other young activists will do those things too. Mm -hmm. But I think something that I'm also struggling with now too is just how many different organizations there are that seem to do like the same thing in a way, but also different organizations have different ways of doing that. So I think of like Black Lives Matter or like NAACP or even... I don't know, just like a lot of different organizations where the method is different, but also like the mission is the same. So for me, like I would love to, I guess, see more like unity in the movement, but also I understand that it's kind of difficult because that didn't also really even happen in the 60s. But how how can you still like push for change and like work together as like different organizations with different methods? Well, it's... Uh... A little while ago, I was telling you, I think, about how I, at one point, had wanted to work in cancer research and how I thought, oh, this will be great. I will find a cure for cancer. And that how then I met these scientists who had been devoting over 20 years of their lives and more, 20 of their professional lives, working on some small aspect mm -hmm. of cell behavior or something or doing that was going to contribute to finding a cure but certainly that one thing would not be enough mm -hmm. I think that that's in many ways the same situation that we're in that the problems that we face the problems of inequality of injustice they are so enormous mm -hmm. I mean so enormous there's it's impossible for one organization to tackle them all Mm -hmm. And it's great that there are some organizations that say, ah, I am interested, I feel that far too many black people are criminalized and arrested in this country. So I'm going to work against mass criminalization. Mm -hmm. So that's a cause, mm -hmm. and there's somebody that can work on that. Mm -hmm. In Lowndes County, I know a woman who is passionately working 
to try to get environmental justice for the poorest people who live in Lowndes County, where the water table is so high that it backs up the sewage into their homes. Mm -hmm. So that's her cause. Mm -hmm. Equally a worthy cause, yes. particularly in that environment. There are kids who are chronically ill mm -hmm. because of that problem. She's working on that. Good for her. Let her work on that. We don't have to have them all in the same organization mm -hmm. for them to be effective. Mm -hmm. And I think that particularly today when we have the kind of communications that we have where we can learn what mm -hmm. she's doing and we can see sometimes that there might be overlap or connections, mm -hmm. that's a good thing. But I think it's great that we have people who mm -hmm. say, oh, this is my passion, I will work on this. Mm -hmm. And that they don't have to be under the umbrella of the same organization. Mm -hmm. In a few weeks, uh, not a few weeks, in a few months, we will hold a convening here in Washington, D.C., which will be the 60th, it'll commemorate the 60th anniversary of the founding of SNCC. Right. But it's one where we are hoping to bring together well over a thousand people who will be activists from different walks of life mm -hmm. and who are working in different parts of the country and on different issues, mm -hmm. some environmental issues, some LGBTQ issues, others education. Mm -hmm. You know, Bob Moses, he believes that algebra <laughs> is the solution. Mm -hmm. He really does. He believes that educational inequities, particularly the lack of numeracy, that we focus on literacy, and he believes that algebra, mm -hmm. that if people aren't literate, in math, don't have that kind of math literacy or numeracy, that then they are at a disadvantage. <laughs> so, so there's room for all of this, I think. And I don't think that it has to, that we have to wait until there is some great leader who then can take us all under her wings and, you know, mm -hmm. sort of say, this is where we need to go. This is what we need to do. Mm -hmm. No. Maybe that person will show up at some point and we will all want to follow her or him, but it doesn't have to happen. Mm -hmm. We can still move forward, right? Right. Um, you mentioned in your first answer that there were only eight of you kind of working in the Children's Crusade out of about 100. And it sparked some curiosity about, I guess, your siblings' involvement and if your family was supportive of what you were doing and kind of what their role was. And it's uh, my my older brother had left for college by that time. My younger brother was two. He was four years younger, mm. and so he was too young okay. to be involved. <laughs> and my parents, my uh, my mother passed had uh, died a few years earlier, and so my mother had passed away. And so I was my father was the parent in the house, mm -hmm. and that he was opposed to it. Mm. He was definitely opposed to it, and uh, but then and he was not alone. He was with all of the other adults in the community uh, that they would have their meetings. They were all Republicans. You'll be interested to know, mm. uh, but and, and it wasn't that wasn't unusual then because in the South at that time the majority of blacks were Republicans because the Democrats were Dixiecrats and were part of the white supremacist mm -hmm. uh, grouping. And so, uh, but he and his other sort of, you know, friends and co-workers and everything were very definitely opposed to our participating in the march. Let's not forget that the original call had been for adults to go and march and mm. support of Martin Luther King. And... <laughs> And they did not go, so <laughs> it fell upon us. <laughs> right. Um, so my last question is just about, I guess, how you were able to balance being both a student and then also an activist and sort of what that balance looked like. Um, and if you were any time kind of feeling, well, I guess maybe you did feel this because you ended up not being a student and chose the activist route at some point, but... 
I don't know, because I think at least in my student leadership right now, like I tend to put like the school part on the back burner. Like I still do it, you know, it's finals. But But I think a lot of times like my energy is initially always directed toward like the activism part, but it just makes it difficult because I don't know, I feel like I tend to overexert myself like in the activism side, but not any other aspect of my life. So like how did you work to, I guess, balance that? Well, I... I, I learned as I went along, uh, and I feel that, um, and, and it was a valuable lesson. It was a valuable life lesson for me, not just about balancing the school and the activism. And I think I could have continued to balance that. But as I said, that I then, uh, after my classmate Sammy Young was killed, mm. that I just you know, made a decision that, no, I, I can return to my studies. Mm-hmm. I really felt that I could return to my studies. And I also felt that what I could contribute through medicine, other people could give, Mm. that there would be other people who would be doctors, but that the number of people who were willing at that point to then sort of stand up to this kind of injustice, to stand up to people who were murdering Mm -hmm. unarmed college students, that was what To me, there was a lack of people who were willing to do that. And so I was willing to stand up at that point to do that. But I think I could have balanced that. Uh, And it's, it's, I balanced other parts of my life as well, because during that, all of those times, I was also a young person who was romantically inclined (laughs) and also had relationships with people too. And so I had a boyfriend. And so that was also a part of a that was a balancing act as well Mm -hmm. but I felt that it was important to have to not see yourself as being you know so singularly focused Mm -hmm. that you couldn't do but one thing at a time Mm -hmm. Um, and so I felt that I could manage these things that it meant carefully using your time Mm -hmm. and I felt that I you know ended up with the best of both worlds in many ways. And like I say, that became a useful life lesson that helped me professionally later as well, so that I was able to also have a career as well as a family later in life uh, and felt that I felt that I was a good parent, a good wife, Mm -hmm. and also did well in my profession. You know, so I just could manage those things. But that was a lesson that I was learning and continue to learn. Okay, so I have a couple questions for you based on your experience. The first is about um, your transition living in both northern cities and in uh, Alabama as well. Um, I want to know what the transition was like for you because you mentioned that you went back and forth to New York City to do internships and then to come back and go to school and then also work with SNCC. Um, what were some of the similarities that you saw between the two in terms of uh, racial animus? And then what were some of the differences that you saw? In that particular time, we're talking in the uh, mid-1960s. And at that time, uh, Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, the South was uh, very visibly segregated. I mean, very, very visibly segregated in ways uh, that was much more what we would associate now with something like old photos of apartheid South Africa, you know, with colored and white signs over everything and places where you knew that you could never go. Uh, When I was a child, we traveled a lot as a family, and we would travel from south to north and uh, from Alabama to California. Mm -hmm. And that I thought we were having so much fun because we went camping when we were traveling, we would camp out and we would cook out over a campfire and everything. And I thought, this is so much fun. And it dawned on me later that the reason that we were doing that mm-hmm. in those southern states and places was because we could not stay in a hotel or a motel. We could not eat in many of the restaurants. Uh, they are the places that would be identified by something like the Green Book that were in the black community where you could eat. But there was no way that we could pull up to a Howard Johnson's Mm -hmm. in a southern area and eat. On the other hand, in New York, that was a world where it was 
quite possible that we could go to Radio City Music Hall, we could go to the museums, we could go places. So the world was very different in that way for me, whether it was the North or whether it was Los Angeles, a major city like LA. So it was a, a world of far greater possibilities. I had white colleagues on my jobs at, uh, when I was doing the internships at Sloan Kettering. I had friends who were white who would then invite me to go and come over and hang out with them and their roommates. And we'd go to the UN where some of them worked. And so it was just a much broader, much more open world where for many of the people that I would encounter their race did not matter. I knew, however, that I was not oblivious to racism in the North, right. however, and I knew that it very definitely existed and it was very obvious. I mean, I think that living in the South at that time, my antenna were finely tuned. And so you could easily go to a place and you could see, oh, okay, here are these people and these white men, they work in these offices. Right. and. All the black men are carrying mail or doing something. They are the worker bees, but they are, they are none of them in the corner offices or in these places. So it was quite obvious, and that was true, too, of places where people lived. I knew there were neighborhoods that you could see that they were all white in some places in the north, in New York and other places, and still are. Right. And there were people who would uh, you meet them and talk and you they would sort of say ah you know you're the first black person who's ever been in my house mm. and it's it, and that was something where it wasn't so i understood that the sort of racism that is so ubiquitous throughout america isn't isolated to a certain place you know it's not something that you can say oh what a shame Alabama, that must be tough. Right. No, we're all in it. Uh, it's the world that we all live in. Staying on the point of location, I want to know if your family was ever considering leaving Alabama for a place that would have been maybe more progressive or safer. Um, and if there were other people in your community that did make that move to leave Alabama for other parts of the country. There were, my family never considered it. I think that part of that was just the uh, the fact that my father was my father was older. Mm -hmm. um, so by the my father was born 1899. So like in 1955, my father was 56 <laughs> years old. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so it's uh, that he was getting towards retirement age rather right. than the age of thinking that, oh, I think I'll moved to New York and uh, started living there. He had daughters, my sisters, who were living in New York City, and they mm -hmm. were well-established in New York. But it was not something that my immediate family was thinking of. We had a number, a large number of relatives and friends, my neighbors. Right. Uh, every summer, there was always this sort of joke, almost, of seeing the cars from the north come down. People would come back to visit relatives and come back to visit. Uh, and so they would come in their cars from Detroit, Chicago, New York, uh, Buffalo, wherever. But they'd come down to you know visit their family. Right. And that this was the evidence of now what we call the Great Migration, uh, where people had moved north, but they still maintained those ties. But my family did not think of doing so, but there were any number of families who very definitely move for the opportunities of jobs and a better life. My final question for you is about uh, the different roles that people play in movements. And so in many movements, you'll find that there are people who are a bit more reserved, who try to stay out of the crossfire a little bit, not because they're not supportive, but maybe because of fear. Um, and I'm wondering, did you experience that in Birmingham? Um, or in Fairfield, and how did those people show their support, even if it was not as, you know, outward um, as some of the people who were in SNCC? Well, they are, they are always the, there are people who do quiet work mm -hmm. for lots of, for many, many years. 
And there was a, a woman, for example, who was the librarian at my high school. Her name was Mabel Neely. And that uh, she hired me at one point to be her driver. And I think this was her way of trying to, to uh, give a poor girl a few dollars, but also to keep me out of trouble. Mm -hmm. Because she knew where I was on Saturdays and uh, on the weekends because I was in driving her to business and professional women's meetings around the state. And that these women then would meet at Montgomery or in Anniston, Alabama, these different places. And that, uh, so I then as the driver would sit in on these meetings and I was just, you know, just sitting on the sidelines. Mm -hmm. And I could then overhear their conversations though of them talking about the circumstances of racism, the circumstances of our people, and what they were doing about it. They were not picket sign holding people. Right. You know, these are the women with their little white gloves and their nice nice hats and things. And and Miss Neely telling me, you think I'm sleeping, but I see how fast you're going. <laughs> <laughs> so it was that kind of relationship. But it was also something where it was a wonderful observation because I saw the quiet role that she was playing. Right. And that, that later led me to work with Dorothy Height. I worked for, um, I guess it was probably 1969 with the National Council of Negro Women and worked with Dorothy Height, Fannie Lou Hamer, uh, You Need a Blackwell wow. in uh, doing rural economic development work for uh, women and it was helping rural women very poor women on farms and sharecroppers mm -hmm. to then help establish and invest in projects which would give them some economic stake and so seeing that kind of work Dorothy Height was another one of those you know she was like Miss Neely was at this level Dorothy Height <laughs> was the queen of the that kind of uh, quiet movement person who was in and and our cities are filled with people like that right yeah